my name is Marika Lehman and I'm with MindLift and I appreciate you taking your time out of your day to join us and Dr. Brown. Today we're going to be talking about how to achieve better outcomes using neurofeedback. So the way the webinar is going to go today, I'm going to give a very brief overview about what MindLift is, what we can offer, um, and then we will have Dr. Brown presenting um, how he uses neurofeedback to achieve better outcomes. We will have time at the end for some questions. Feel free to put them into the question box, um, but we will have time at the end to get those answered. So, well, great. I, um, first and foremost, uh, thank you. If you are just joining with us, I appreciate you taking your time to join and we're gonna dive right into this. So, what is MindLift? Well, MindLift is the platform where you can have the capability to offer neurofeedback both remotely and in clinic. And really our goal is to empower mental health care practitioners and individuals with digital holistic mental care, CBT tools, obviously neurofeedback, and then at home EEG. Um, and of course we offer the neurofeedback, but it isn't the only thing that you will have the capability to do in your practice. You will also have um, the option to do assessments, uh, different digital tools. The assessments are things like symptom tracking, continuous performance tasks, and then the EEG sensing where you can actually get a visual of what's happening in the brain um, you know, at baseline and then after X amount of treatment. Uh, the digital tools include things like journaling, meditation, and then um, breathing exercises, stuff like that. And if it's something that is applicable for your practice, you even have the capability to communicate remotely with your clients. So we've really become the leader worldwide in the remote neurofeedback space. We have over 400,000 neurotherapy sessions logged on the system. Uh, we have over 14,000 clients and um, over 9 million minutes trained on the system. When MindLift was started, our goal really was to make neurofeedback accessible and affordable for patients, because um, traditionally that's not the case. And so what we've done um, to make it accessible and affordable to clinicians as well is we've created an applied learning program. The Applied Learning Program, we match you with a mentor um, and your mentor will be your neurofeedback expert to walk you through on obviously neurofeedback, but then also how do you implement that into your practice using the MindLift system? So it's really this way that your you as a clinician will have easier access as opposed to having to go through the old school 36 to 40 hour course, spend a lot of money and then still have to pay for a system after that. So what does that look like? Well, I'm gonna show you the hardware kit so that you can see. Um, we do use a Muse headband, but we have added in an electrode. So if you've ever seen the traditional neurofeedback system, you know that it can be quite cumbersome and it's not always the easiest for some patients to use. With the headband, they just place it on. And then with the electrode, you have the capability to train off the 1020 system as needed. So how does it work? Well, let me show you a little video so that you can see what the system looks like, what you will see as the clinician and what your patients will see. When you onboard with us, you will have access to a clinician dashboard. This is what your dashboard would look like. We give you your own clinician code that you can share with your clients. And then your clients have the capability to um, enter in that code. Then they're linked to you and only you once they sign up. What you see on your dashboard and what your clients see are completely different things. Um, I am not going to bore you with this entire video, but I do want to show you a few things. It's really simple to set your clients up. Your dashboard does not require any special software or it to be on one certain computer. 
you can definitely access this really anywhere that you have a Wi-Fi signal. When you're setting your patient up, you have the capability to assign them different questionnaires to track symptoms. These questionnaires, there's 40 of them built into the system. You could also customize them based on your needs and your client's needs. And then what's really great is that you have the capability to turn these on or off and make them recurring, meaning that if there was something you wanted to track starting at baseline, and then maybe again after 100 minutes of training, the system makes it very easy for you to do that. It's as simple as entering it into your dashboard, and then when the client is ready to train, it will actually ping them that it's time for their assessments. What I've paused on here is just showing you that you will have access to these different assessments, but if you would like to turn them on or off, it's as simple as toggling a button. And then I am gonna fast forward to what the client would actually see um, <clears throat> when they're ready to train. What's really nice when, whether you're working remotely or in clinic, but especially remotely, is that the system will actually tell the client what they're doing. So once they have their head mm -hmm. done, and on where do they put the electrode? Is there a different program that they would rather choose? So maybe you've set them with, up with multiple protocols. They have the capability to be in control of their treatment as well. Um, and then when it's time to train, it's really simple. The system will get a signal quality check so that they know that they're getting a good signal. In fact, it won't let them train if they don't have a good signal, which is good to know. And then they have the capability to um, choose different games or videos um, based on what it is that they feel like doing. We do have YouTube built into the app. So if they get sick of doing the game, uh, no harm or foul on that. And then I am gonna fast forward quite a bit because I wanna show you the capabilities in terms of the data and what you can do as a clinician. Obviously via the dashboard, you will have the capability to review all of your clients' assessments. So if there's anything that you want to track over time, it's really easy to access. Um, you will be able to monitor them via the dashboard. You can go in, you can see any of the assessments you have assigned to them, and then um, also see the symptoms over time. Something that we are very excited about that actually just launched this week is you now have the capability to do brain mapping. I'm not going to touch too much on this because Dr. Brown is going to mention this in his presentation, but this is something that we've worked really hard on and we're really excited to share this with you today. Um, and something that's also really helpful as a clinician, whether regardless of what types of patients you're working with, is you can create progress reports for your clients to share with them. The system makes it very easy to generate graphs, to generate reports, and then to even see over time how much they're improving. So it's a really beautiful way to take something abstract and put it into something tangible. I am just scratching the surface on the capabilities of the system. But Dr. Brown is going to take you on a journey into how he utilizes this in his practice and um, and also how he utilizes the data. So I am going to take this time now to introduce Dr. Brown. And then after I do, the floor will be yours. Um, we are so lucky to have you, Dr. Brown. Uh, Dr. Brown has over 35 years of experience in the clinical, organizational and community mental health fields. He's received specialized training in psychotherapy and assessment, health psychology, and prevention-oriented community psychology. He also maintains a full-range private practice where he works primarily with adults and older adolescents coping with depression, anxiety, cognitive, and attention issues. In addition to clinical work, he has held posts at Fuller Graduate School of Psychology and at Seattle Pacific University as Dean and Associate Professor. And then he is also a member of our clinician network at MindLift, and he will be our guest speaker today. And it's so nice to have you here. And without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marika. 
I have to say it is a pleasure to be here. Um, as Merica said, my name's uh, Nathan Brown. I'm a clinical psychologist up in Washington State, up in the upper left corner of the United States. And the reason I'm particularly excited to do this workshop today is that I have good news uh, to share with you. And that has to do with the state of the art of neurofeedback today. Uh, as Merica said, I have done uh, neurofeedback for quite some time and um, really began in the 1980s when neurofeedback was uh, something that uh, was basically in the research lab. You had large headsets, looked a little bit like Frankenstein. Uh, the computer that drove it was pr pretty much the size of my desk. And it was very interesting. We, we and I was in grad school in Southern California, and there was a good bit of neurofeedback research going on. And th those of us in the research field knew that there was something uh, important happening uh, with neurofeedback, but it was not practical for the clinic yet. So over time, I have been uh, lucky to be able to um, uh, follow the evolution of neurofeedback as we got into the 90s and the early 2000s. We began to get uh, equipment that was available in the office. Still pretty cumbersome, uh, still pretty cumbersome equipment. And it was something that uh, uh, unfortunately was available only to people with fairly extensive training and uh, individuals who had uh, money <laughs> to spare uh, to purchase this equipment. Uh, so um, we are at a very different moment uh, now. and. Uh, we're at a point in time in this field where neurofeedback, I think, is now within reach of, of any clinician, uh, anyone in, in health services uh, that has a need for uh, this kind of tool. It is now accessible. And I'd like to look at that potential uh, through the lens of anxiety today. Um, Anxiety is uh, probably the common cold in some ways of uh, any clinical practice. Uh, anxiety is a condition that in, is either the primary presenting problem for people that we work with, whether we're psychologists or psychotherapists or even chiropractors and other allied health professionals, physicians. Uh, we all either are dealing directly with anxiety or anxiety is a secondary condition sometimes a condition that is impeding the individual's ability to make use of the therapy that we have to offer them. Now I got my slide. So uh, we're going to look at the use of neurofeedback through the lens of anxiety. I think it's a pretty straightforward way to see the utility of neurofeedback. Uh, what I'd like to do in this presentation is really hit three main points. One is to introduce neurofeedback, particularly for those of you who are new to the idea of neurofeedback. I want to give you a way of thinking about this tool. And I'm hopeful that by the end of this presentation, you will understand that neurofeedback is not a mysterious tool that somehow lives far away from what you do day to day as a clinician, but it is really a new way of addressing the kinds of things that we're all concerned about uh, as clinicians for our patients. Secondly, we're going to talk about anxiety from the perspective of the brain and uh, look at some basic brain function that seems to underlie the presenting um, uh, uh, circumstances in which people come to our office dealing with anxiety. Armed with those two things, the, the uh, uh, perspective on neurofeedback and a perspective on anxiety in the brain, I'd like to share two case studies with you briefly that I think illustrate uh, all of that, kind of pull this together. And I'm going to make sure to reserve some time at the end for questions. If anyone has questions along the way, feel free to put them in chat. Uh, if I see them and it's something I can handle as we go along, I'll respond in real time. Otherwise, we'll have time at the end and I'll be glad to respond to those questions as, as we get there. Okay, let's talk about neurofeedback, our first primary point. As I mentioned, technological advances have been rapidly evolving, especially in the last 10 years. 
uh, neurofeedback is no longer something that is only available to uh, clinicians who have the funds to afford it. It's no longer something simply in the research lab. It's something that can be available to any one of us that uh, uh, see that how it can fit into their practice. I, in my view, there's three basic ways that I use neurofeedback as a tool. One is as a supplement to psychotherapy. If I have an individual who presents to me with, let's say, anxiety, I may right at the outset, in addition to my other assessment procedures, I may give them the, uh, the assessment uh, tool uh, that MindLift offers, which gives me a very powerful look at brain, overall brain function. And I'll put that together with some of my more traditional clinical tools to measure anxiety and measure other things that are of clinical concern and, uh, and supplement psychotherapy with neurofeedback. So this would be a scenario in which uh, the person comes to me once a week for psychotherapy, for instance, uh, and then during the week they're practicing with neurofeedback, possibly once a day. Uh, they're able to get multiple doses of neurofeedback. They don't have to come to my office. Uh, once a week or twice a week, and that means they can make progress more quickly. Secondly, I work with neurofeedback as a standalone training method. There are people who come to me, uh, patients who come to me, who are not looking for psychotherapy. Uh, perhaps they already have a therapist, uh, but they, they, um, maybe they've been referred by, by their therapist or someone else, and they're interested in doing that training on its own. Most of the people who come to me in that regard are not necessarily people who carry a diagnosis. They may be coming not so much to overcome anxiety. They may be coming because they want to raise their game. There are many people I work with in my practice nowadays who are um, in business or they're in athletics or they're in some field that is a high demand field and they want to find ways to raise their game. And neurofeedback is a powerful way to do that, to enhance creativity, decision-making, a sense of mindfulness, uh, any of a number of things that are very important in the workplace. Thirdly, there are times that I may use the neurofeedback equipment, the mind lift equipment uh, in the psychotherapy process itself during the session as a way of tracking physiological responses to things that emerge during psychotherapy. The neurofeedback equipment, as well as a variety of biofeedback tools, can be very powerful that way, particularly for individuals who are dissociated and may not be particularly aware of emotional processes that, that their, their bodies and their brains will tell, will tell us about. And finally, just to underscore the point that Marika mentioned a moment ago, uh, neurofeedback can be delivered in office, but now it can be delivered remotely. Your patients can train at home, on their own timing, on their own schedule. They can receive multiple doses, so to speak, multiple sessions during the course of a week and uh, speed up the, the training so they get to the, the desired effect more quickly. Okay, let's talk about neurofeedback and what it is. Uh, to start this, I thought I would go to that time-honored academic resource of Wikipedia, which actually has the most concise definition of neurofeedback that I found. So I'm offering it to you here. And this is one slide I'm going to read verbatim because it's got some, some really good uh, uh, elements in it. Neurofeedback, which is also called neurotherapy, you may find me use those terms interchangeably, is a type of biofeedback. So biofeedback is a larger category that we'll talk about in a moment. Neurofeedback presents real-time feedback. That's essential, real-time feedback from brain activity in order to reinforce healthy brain function through operant conditioning. It's, I think, very important and useful to keep in mind that neurofeedback in one sense is a very specialized form of operant conditioning. Any of us who, as part of our training, learned about behavioral psychology, operant conditioning, I would just say to you, you already know 30% of what you need to know in order to uh, work with neurofeedback effectively. Because as you'll see in a moment, uh, neurofeedback is focused on the brain and the brain is operating according to behavioral principles. 
Okay, so how does it work? Let's go a little step deeper. As I mentioned, neurofeedback is a specialized form of biofeedback. Biofeedback comprises a set of tools that focus on different physiological systems. There is, for instance, EMG biofeedback, which has to do with muscle tension and the potential for neuromuscular re-education is one, one thing that EMG biofeedback is useful for. Thermal biofeedback has to do with uh, teaching an individual how to control their body's vascular responses. Uh, galvanic skin response biofeedback would be another form that has to do with the electrical potential in the skin. Uh, heart rate variability biofeedback uh, is a very powerful modality in biofeedback. Each of these are focused on different physical systems that underlie human performance, underlie physiological performance. And the way biofeedback works in general and neurofeedback in particular is based on, interestingly enough, the feedback principle. So what do I mean by the feedback principle? I'll just explain it to you the way I explain it to my clients. If I ask you to make a fist, you can make a fist pretty easily. Then I ask you, how do you know that you made a fist? And you will say to me, after you think about it for a moment, well, I can see it, right? And I can feel it. I can feel that sensation of my fist being clenched. Those comprise two very powerful feedback loops. And our neuromuscular system is rich with these kinds of feedback loops. If you have feedback, you can have amazing control over a physical system. And if you have feedback plus time, you can develop mastery over that system. So for instance, if I spent, I'm told 10,000 hours with these things, these fingers, I could learn how to play piano quite well. Okay. That's, Feedback plus time equals mastery. Uh, now that's easy to understand with something like the neuromuscular system. However, let's use a different example. Now, let's say I ask you to slow your heart rate. Well, many of you in the audience uh, uh, kind of have a hint about this, that uh, if you wanted to slow your heart rate, you could probably take a few deep breaths and that would probably lower your heart rate. But then my next question to you would be, well, how do you know that you lowered your heart rate? And the truth is you wouldn't know for sure. You might feel some sensations, but you wouldn't really know that that had happened. We don't have a clear feedback loop, most of us, for heart rate. I can solve that by giving you a stethoscope. And uh, once I've given you the stethoscope and you put it in your ears, you can hear your heart rate. And inside of a few minutes, you could learn to lower your heart rate several beats a minute over time. If you spent a long time of practice with that, you could lower your heart rate dramatically. In fact, in the 1960s, uh, Barbara Brown and a number of early researchers in biofeedback went to India and they watched gurus uh, in India lower their heart rate down to around 30, 35 beats a minute. Uh, pretty remarkable control. And it turns out what was happening with them is they had performed so many years of meditation that they were able to hear their pulse in their ear. That gave them the feedback loop. And so they had the feedback loop, they added time, years of practice, and pretty soon they were able to have that amazing degree of control over their body. So the feedback principle, simply put, is that if we have a feedback loop we can develop control over systems that we used to think of as involuntary. Way back when dinosaurs ruled the earth and I was taking my first course in physiological psychology, we talked about the voluntary and involuntary nervous system. We don't generally use those terms now because we know that's kind of a misnomer. It's really whether there is a feedback loop or not. Second principle is the principle of homeostasis. Complex systems, the brain is certainly a complex system, seek homeostasis, it se they seek balance. Your, your uh, back, for instance, wants balance. If you lean over for about 10 or 15 minutes, pretty soon your lower back is gonna be telling you that it wants balance, it wants homeostasis, and it's gonna use pain to get you back up upright, okay? 
the brain also is seeking homeostasis. The brain seeks balance. And the brain has evolved for hundreds of thousands of years to utilize information from the environment to its benefit and to promote homeostasis. And that strategy for uh, homeostasis follows the principles of operant conditioning, by which I mean if a behavior is rewarded, it will tend to increase. As we get into this a little further, you'll see how that uh, works out with neurofeedback. The third principle I want to share with you is the principle of neuroplasticity. Uh, also, when I was taking my uh, way back early course in uh, physiological uh, uh, psychology, we tended to think that the brain didn't change. It didn't really repair itself. Uh, that turns out not to be true. Uh, there are neuroplastic responses in the brain in which recovery and repair uh, are possible. Strengthening of neuro circuit, neural circuits can occur. And neural circuit repair and strengthening does occur as a result of neurofeedback. So with, neuro, with neurofeedback, we're not simply sort of improving brain habits. We're literally engaging in uh, neural, neural strengthening, if you will, strengthening the neural circuits that we're training. I had a hard time explaining that to a 15-year-old client until I said to her, you know, it's like with your cell phone when you push the button to reset to factory conditions. Uh, there is a sense in which that's what we're doing with neurofeedback. Uh, the final thing I want to say on this slide is that neurofeedback is an evidence-based clinical tool. This is something that around which there has been a great deal of research. Uh, there is a reference that I'm just going to say verbally here. I'll also point out that this reference and others are at the back of this slide deck, which I believe will be made available to you all uh, at some point following the webinar. So if you're interested in learning more about any of the things that I've talked about, you can go to that reference slide. This partic particular reference is put out by the AAPB, that's the uh, Professional Organization for Neurofeedback and Biofeedback, and it's called Evidence-Based Practice in Biofeedback and Neurofeedback. It's a spiral-bound book. It uh, summarizes hundreds and thousands of studies around neurofeedback and biofeedback with respect to the treatment of different uh, conditions, and that's a very good next step if you're interested in learning more about the evidence basis for neurofeedback. All right, this slide just simply illustrates visually uh, what I was talking about before about that feedback loop. Uh, if we start uh, down with the little person with, who happens to have a um, um, Muse headset on, we have a headset with sensors in it that read brainwave activities. At times, we may use that external electrode that Marika was mentioning. That is then translated to brainwaves, uh, or the brainwaves, excuse me, are translated into um, uh, information with respect to whether, whether the brain is performing in the desired direction or not. That is in turn transformed into visual and auditory cues back to the brain. So we're teaching the brain about itself in real time. This creates a feedback loop in which operant conditioning can take place. So at its simplest, this is what's happening with neurofeedback. Okay, let's talk about anxiety. And you see I've called it uh, that at the core of anxiety is the fight, flight, or freeze response. Back in the day, we called it just fight or flight. We know now that uh, there is another characteristic response to stress uh, called freeze. I think that would be the topic of another webinar. But for now, I want to give you this definition of anxiety because it really does a good job of focusing on the physical nature of anxiety. Uh, the fight or flight response is an autonomic, automatic, also autonomic, physiological reaction to a, an event that is perceived as stressful or frightening. So you see there we have the filter of perception uh, is, is involved with uh, this response. The perception of threat activates the sympathetic nervous system. It activates that whole fight or flight response, triggers an acute stress response that prepares the body to fight or flee. 
These responses are evolutionary adaptations. One reason I like this definition is it grounds the uh, a perspective on anxiety in terms of evolutionary terms, because there's an adaptive purpose to anxiety that we'll, we'll uh, explore here for a moment. Those evolutionary adaptations increase chances for survival in threatening situations. And then finally, overly frequent, intense, or inappropriate activation of the fight or flight response is implicated in a range of clinical conditions, including most anxiety disorders. So we could have another webinar on depression, another one on attention and, and so forth, and those are very um, uh, important topics and topics that neurofeedback is very relevant to. I tend to think of anxiety as being a very critical um, um, uh, phenomenon to understand and to consider with respect to neurofeedback. First, because it is so common as an element of, a, of presenting uh, issues with patients. Secondly, because it illustrates what's happening in the brain. And thirdly, it illustrates that we can do something about those patterns in the brain using neurofeedback. Having mentioned the brain, let's go to that. And uh, as, as um, I do many of my sessions on Zoom nowadays, I have all my props with me. So I have my, my little brain here, uh, at least half of a brain uh, that uh, will illustrate this. Uh, you'll notice here that I've broken down three basic areas in the brain. There are obviously many other areas that are relevant, but I want to identify three in particular that are very key in understanding anxiety and different forms of anxiety from the perspective of the brain. First of all, in the back, in the back left, in fact, this is the primary uh, area that we tend to assess, is a structure called the amygdala. The amygdala performs a number of functions, but the relevant function here is it performs uh, a, the function of a primitive alarm system. If you're a cave person and you're walking down the jungle path and you see a saber-toothed tiger coming at you, that, pro that gets processed back here in the visual cortex. And interestingly, the amygdala is right by the visual cortex. So if you were designing an alarm system, you would want it right by the visual cortex, wouldn't you? You would want that to go off as quickly as possible. Well, evolution apparently had the same idea. So we get immediate triggering of the amygdala if we see a threat. Keep in mind that uh, cave people, you know, they, their threats were saber-toothed tigers. We don't have too many of those around right now. We have more 21st century stressors, which we're actually not designed too well for uh, from a brain perspective, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, the amygdala triggers the, the, the forward part of the limbic system. Amygdala is technically part of the limbic system in the posterior, but the, the main part of the limbic system initiates and manages the fight or flight response. This is kind of mission control for managing the fight or flight response. And so you have very rapidly, um, uh, within hundred, hundredths of a second, you have messages going down to the body to uh, initiate, by some counts, up to 2,000 neurochemical changes. Digestion slows and stops. Uh, there's no time to digest when you're about to be digested by that saber-toothed tiger. Uh, all of those um, uh, changes that the limbic system is directing to the, to the body are all for the purpose of preparing to fight or flight, fight or flee. That's what's happening in response to the amygdala. Now, that message takes a very short amount of time. I've seen some, some uh, studies say that's about three one-hundredths of a second takes all the way to about nine one hundredths of a second for that message, that alarm to get to the front where we actually do our thinking. This is why if you're at a baseball game and a fly ball comes, first you flinch and then you ask yourself, what was that? That's because that ball coming at you uh, has, has initiated this alarm process even before you get a chance to think about it. So I'm mentioning that because um, this right this immediately illustrates that we have parallel processes occurring in the brain. We have this sort of uh, hindbrain uh, uh, response to threat, 
And then we have later a forebrain response to threat, the prefrontal cortices, uh, where we, uh, where higher cognitive and executive functions occur. That's a different uh, circuit, so to speak. Now, from a brain perspective, I find it very helpful to think of two primary pathways to anxiety. First is amygdala-based anxiety. This is anxiety that is coming from that alarm being triggered. And sometimes that alarm gets triggered because maybe it's not a saber-toothed tiger, but maybe a bus is coming at us and narrowly misses us. There are physical threats that will trigger it. Sometimes this will get triggered by um, trauma. Sometimes this will get triggered by um, a concussion or some other kind of uh, injury to the brain. Uh, it can trigger this alarm and there, there is a sense in which this alarm can essentially get stuck in the on position. You tend to get over activation of the amygdala. If you have that, the most common thing that I notice patients report who have an overactive um, amygdala is this experience of free floating anxiety. Maybe it's mild, maybe it's just a mild sense of unease. Maybe it shades into feelings of danger or dread or, or those kinds of things. But they often don't have a particular object. It's free floating. I'm anxious. I'm not quite sure why. Well, the reason that individual may be anxious doesn't have a lot to do necessarily with what's happening immediately in the environment. It has to do with the fact that this alarm is stuck in the on position. Okay. That form of anxiety, which I've labeled on this slide as amygdala-based anxiety, is to be distinguished from what we might call cortical anxiety. This is the part where we start thinking. This is where cognitive behavioral therapists, uh, that is kind of their bread and butter, right? Or our bread and butter, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, uh, where we begin to try and make sense of the world. We begin to try and make sense of things. And perhaps we have... Um, uh, negative self-talk, or perhaps we have uh, uh, other kinds of errors of thinking that start to creep in. And pretty soon, we are, our frontal lobes are, are sending that alarm message to the, to the um, limbic system as well. So we can have anxiety that's kind of driven from the back. We can have anxiety that's driven from the, for, from the front. In either case, it leads to an overly aroused limbic system. Okay, let me find my button here. Okay, so traditionally, outside of neurofeedback, how do we as clinicians tend to approach anxiety? Well, when you start to think about anxiety from these two directions, it, it's, it's interesting because you start to realize that there are somatically oriented techniques. There are techniques, as you can see here, relaxation training breathing practices, progressive relaxation, behavioral techniques like systematic desensitization, all of those are somatically oriented. They're, they're aimed at calming the body, and that in turn may often calm the mind uh, as well. There are cognitively oriented techniques, techniques that are more oriented up here. Cognitive behavioral strategies like the ABC, uh, chart uh, in terms of identifying negative beliefs, uh, negative self-talk, reframing strategies, all the rich set of tools that CBT offers uh, might fall under that more cognitively oriented set of techniques. And then we have blended techniques. Uh, mindfulness, uh, of course, has many different forms, but mindfulness often uh, mindfulness techniques often start by encouraging the person to focus on what's happening physically and then allowing themselves to become aware of uh, thought patterns and so forth in that context. Dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, has a similar grounding often in many respects in physiology. And meditation, meditation, there are forms that could fit any of these three categories uh, as a method to calm anxiety. So what I'm trying to point out here is simply that outside of neurofeedback and biofeedback, as clinicians, regardless of what our discipline is, chances are you've got one or more of these tools already in your toolkit. 
And if you're like me, you will be grateful that we have these tools. You may also be frustrated by how difficult it can be for people to uh, use them. Uh, because if I'm very anxious, it's very hard for me to make use of a CBT strategy. It's very hard to fill out an ABC chart when um, I'm, I'm um, extremely anxious. And so we get kind of, a, kind of a cycle going there. Well, let's contrast that with neurofeedback. How does neurofeedback reduce anxiety? Well, those traditional techniques that we just described, they have the aim of indirectly down-regulating that limbic system, down-regulating that parasympathetic arousal. Um, and uh, they're, they're focusing through kind of body uh, uh, pathways versus more mind pathways. Neurofeedback has the same aim uh, to down-regulate that limbic system, but it has some advantages. First, and perhaps foremost, neurofeedback lets clinicians directly influence brainwave patterns uh, that trigger that overall arousal. So instead of an indirect technique, we're directly talking to the limbic system. We're directly retraining the limbic system to downregulate. Secondly, neurofeedback gives you some objective measures. You can actually understand uh, with some degree of some significant degree of objectivity whether you are approaching the target, uh, the goals that you have for your patient in therapy or not. I will have to say this is one of the things that attracted me to neurofeedback early on because the idea of having uh, some objective indicators for success was really appealing to me in undertaking something that can be as complex and difficult to measure as psychotherapy. Uh, thirdly, neurofeedback puts the patient in the driver's seat. Neurofeedback is not something, uh, especially when you're able to give them the equipment and send them home, it's not something that they have to rely on you uh, for the training. It puts them in control of their own outcomes. There's an interesting thing that I find about neurofeedback is the way it illustrates what for me has become a very common statement to my patients in psychotherapy in general. And that statement is what you want to do is focus on your actions and let go of the outcomes. Focus on your actions, let go of the outcomes. With neurofeedback, there are certain actions, certain mental choices that an individual can take, not to mention the choice of using the neurofeedback uh, at all, putting the, the headset on. But those are actions that they can take that can lead to an outcome they couldn't otherwise control, uh, which is the reduction of anxiety. Patients generally don't stop being anxious if you tell them to stop being anxious. They generally need to focus on things they can control that lead to that desired outcome. Neurofeedback creates a really clear pathway to that. And just flowing right from that, neurofeedback promotes uh, greatly increased self-awareness in my experience uh, for patients to get a very granular sense of how their body is reacting to issues that they had perhaps previously only thought about in more abstract terms. It's very powerful. And to promote self-efficacy, more of a focus, again, on the things that they can control. OK, so as we've said, uh, neurofeedback is a core feature of probably most of the conditions that you and I uh, address in our practices. And I just want to pause a moment and just underscore that notion that whatever clinical approach you may have, whether, and again, whether it's psychotherapy or uh, chiropractics or medicine, whatever your clinical approach, neurotherapy can complement the way you already work. I find, for instance, I do quite a bit of cognitive behavioral and DBT kind of work. And uh, there are, it, it's very helpful uh, to me and often to my patients to understand what the things are that are, in, I'm pointing to the front left, which is where we do our, our processing uh, of many of the things we address in cognitive behavioral work, to be able to explain and work with patients in understanding how their whole body and their whole mind are responding to the issues that are uh, before them can be very powerful. Okay, I'd like to take uh, uh, the last couple of minutes here and uh, talk about uh, a couple of cases that I think illustrate uh, 
uh, the two different forms of anxiety that I've been discussing. Uh, the first case is going to be for based on amygdala-based anxiety. Uh, this is going to be an individual who is dealing with significant trauma. Secondly, we're going to look at cortically-based anxiety, anxiety that seemed uh, based on the data that we saw in the um, assessment uh, was driven more from the front. I do want to mention, by the way, I should have mentioned this earlier, that these two categories, amygdala-based anxiety and cortically-based anxiety, those are conceptual terms that get, um, there, there can be evidence in the assessment and in the other information you have about a patient as to which of these predominate. But of course, there is a blend uh, in many cases. If you have that alarm going off and you're experiencing free-floating anxiety long enough, eventually you're going to start having some cortically-based anxiety as well because you're going to start um, uh, trying to make sense of why, the, why you never uh, seem to be able to calm down. And so we can get that kind of blend. Nevertheless, I think it can be very helpful to look at the brain basis as distinct and it certainly affects the neurofeedback strategy with respect to treatment. Okay, both of these cases involve patients of mine, um, outpatient practice, uh, and the neurotherapy was supplementing uh, mostly cognitive behavioral and some IFS, internal family systems oriented uh, therapy strategies. Let's start with case one. Um, with each of these, I'm gonna give you just a quick overview of presenting history and symptoms. We're gonna, I'm going to show you the relevant parts of the neurofunctional assessment. We don't have time to go all the way through uh, an entire assessment, so I'm going to zero in on the parts of the assessment that are rele relevant for these particular people. Thirdly, we're going to look at expressed versus latent traits. That's a term that I, I should explain here for a moment. Uh, in the brain, we see certain patterns that may arise. And for instance, that overly active alarm in the back, we would call that a latent trait. It's a trait that's, it, that is uh, observable in the brain. It's a measurable pattern. Now, particularly if that's at a mild to moderate level, that individual may not actually be experiencing uh, the, the free-floating anxiety that I was talking about. Okay, that would be on the expressed side. It is possible to have a latent trait that is not yet expressed. If you have an individual who, um, you know, for instance, they're very low level of stress in their life, uh, you know, they're um, um, not really having a lot of triggers, there's no history for tr of trauma, that sort of thing, then you may get that, that discrepancy where you see a, a potential for that kind of response but it's not yet been expressed. In neurofeedback in general, what we're trying to do is look for latent traits. I'll kind of do a Venn diagram here. Latent traits that overlap with expressed traits. The presenting problems, the presenting issues that we see with that uh, person actually overlap with a latent trait that we know tends to correlate with that symptom. Once we find that, that sweet spot is where we want to train. Uh, we want to pick uh, one of the training protocols that's relevant to that overlap. It's pretty much what that last point makes is that that brain dysregulation that aligns with presenting problems, that's what we tend to focus on at that point. Okay, so let's talk about this case. And um, this is um, an 11 year old male. So it's a young boy. Uh, who presented with a history of adverse childhood experiences, um, multiple trauma uh, in his life, uh, was um, abandoned by his parents, was in foster care at the time that I saw him, uh, was carrying diagnoses of post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, also difficulty sleeping. Uh, behaviorally, this 11-year-old this, uh, was very shut down, tended to be avoidant. Uh, he was in, living with foster parents. He would spend most of his time in his room and uh, basically hiding from other people. Um, in therapy, he was fairly shut down. The therapist re um, reported that there was little uh, progress. They were having little progress in uh, addressing 
or even, even his acknowledging some of the early trauma that he had been experiencing. This, by the way, is a common presenting um, um, or referring situation where I will have a therapist who will refer to me for neurofeedback because they have a, a situation, often a, a situation that is uh, trauma-based, that is sort of stalled. The psychotherapy is somewhat stalled. Okay, so that's what I've just given you very briefly is sort of a traditional overview. Let's look at what the uh, neurofunctional assessment uh, has to say. And this screen, what I wanted to show you here is here, uh, that purple area, uh, is sort of the summary of the entire uh, assessment. The assessment that MindLift puts together is not just uh, neurofeedback. Uh, as Marika mentioned, uh, MindLift has the potential for you to do your clinical um, screening and clinical assessments uh, and follow-up assessments through their system. There are built-in questionnaires uh, that are clinical-grade questionnaires that you can utilize for that. In this case, you'll see that uh, we have a radar chart here. And essentially what the purple tells you, the more purple that you have, the closer you are to optimal functioning. This would indicate, for instance, you have uh, this left-right symmetry, that's a brainwave category. That's all the way out to the end. What that means is every score in that section was in the, in the norm, uh, was not an area of clinical concern. If we move back over here to questionnaires, you'll see that's down at zero. All that means is that there were no scores among all the surveys that we had this person take in which, that, in which he was in the, the non-clinical realm. And you can see that right here. Right, right here, you've got the GHQ, which many of you will recognize. That's a standard overall uh, general mental health questionnaire. And he's uh, past the clinical cut point. So we've got some severe overall mental health issues here. There's an ADHD rating scale for children, also in the red zone, indicating a severe problem with attention. And um, mild to moderate um, uh, anxiety. Uh, this is, uh, you know, kids often under-report, and uh, um, the brain, however, does not. So this is another interesting thing to look at, is how what the brain says sometimes is different than what the mind says uh, in terms of a patient's report. Okay. So that's just an opener for this. Now let's go to the primary thing I want to share with you. And we're going to look primarily at the back of the head. We've been talking about that alarm in the back, so now you're gonna to get to see this in action. And we're gonna look in particular at alpha performance. Alpha is a relatively slow brainwave. It is, uh, I think of it as the rest and repair brainwave. Um, any form of meditation generally is promoting alpha. Uh, when you close your eyes, alpha tends to go up. Uh, we are hardwired for that slow wave activity to kind of increase when you close your eyes. Think of evolution. If you close your eyes, it must be safe enough for the brain to go into rest and repair. And so we get that, that hardwired response. If, if the brain is functioning properly, where alpha rises uh, when you go from eyes open to eyes closed. That is not what's happening with this child. Um, we look at this statistic, alpha response in the posterior, and it's getting at exactly the question that I was just framing. What happens to, to this part of the brain when we go from eyes open to eyes closed? Well, I'll tell you what's supposed to happen is alpha is supposed to rise, as I just mentioned. The neurofeedback data, I can be much more precise. The amplitude of alpha should rise by 50% in this part of the brain. It should go up by 50%. See, we have a red zone score because what's happening for this 11-year-old uh, is instead of rising by at least 50%, he's dropping by 8%, okay? So this, this uh, statistic basically is getting at the, the capacity of the amygdala to calm itself, to shut that alarm off. And right off the bat, we know we have a problem in that this alpha response is 
very much inadequate. Okay. The second marker that I've marked here with the arrow is peak alpha in the posterior with eyes closed. So peak alpha, this is a statistic that is getting at the subband of alpha. You know, brain waves are frequencies, right? And frequencies exist on bands and subbands. Alpha uh, goes from 8 to 12 hertz. There is, it turns out from the research, a difference between slow alpha and fast alpha in its ability to calm that alarm down. Slow alpha turns out to be not nearly as good at uh, calming the alarm. Uh, you want the faster form of alpha. You want nine and a half hertz or higher. He has pegged the needle at eight hertz. So we've got the very slowest form of alpha here. So if I put these two things together, alpha response and peak alpha, what that tells me is that there are two problems with alpha in the back with respect to calming the alarm. One, we have insufficient amplitude set, uh, amount, if you might think of it that way. There's not enough alpha to calm the alarm down. And secondly, the alpha that is being increased is of the poorer quality, of the slower quality. Now, there are a number of researchers that have identified particularly these two statistics as trauma markers. Uh, what, that, what they mean by that is that not everyone who has these markers uh, showing in the red uh, has had trauma, but virtually everyone who has had trauma that has not been treated has one or more of these markers. So this 11-year-old boy has two. We have both of these trauma markers deeply in the red. So this is, you know, if you think of the metaphor, that alarm is just kind of shrieking uh, in the background. Uh, so that is going to create dysreg that that is dysregulation in the back. That is going to create problems going forward because remember that that alarm signal is picked up by the limbic system. And what's the limbic system's job? It's to get you ready for fight or flight, right? It's and it's going to create uh, a form of dysregulation going forward. Okay, I'll also mention before we get too far away from it that this same alpha response, same statistic, is also very close in the red. This is sort of a yellow zone score here uh, in the midbrain. So this dysregulation has carried forward, and now we have a problem in the midbrain where the midbrain is likely not getting adequate rest and repair. So we would start to wonder if there's some problems in the midbrain that we would need to deal with. As it turned out, there were, and that uh, led to some subsequent uh, protocol, some subsequent neurofeedback training. But what we're focusing on today has to do with the anxiety that was initiated in the back of the head. So hopefully you see this is, I think, as clear an example as I could find of, um, of an amygdala-based anxiety. This is a child who, uh, felt anxious, acknowledged that he felt anxious, could not say why. Um, he was sufficiently uh, repressed. He was not uh, really um, able to allow himself to really address any of those traumatic kind of uh, uh, earlier memories. He was kind of stalled in therapy. Um, but that alarm is going off and it's creating an anxiety that is uh, kind of a free-floating, non-specific anxiety. Okay, here is a look at the brain map. As uh, America said, this is just rolled out uh, last week, so I'm still getting familiar with it myself. Uh, but this gives you an idea of the um, alpha scores. And the primary thing I'm going to look at here is, um, remember, we want alpha to go up from eyes open to eyes closed. So that's what these two columns are, eyes open and eyes closed. And here we have... They've, they've broken it down here into three uh, different uh, spectra, uh, the sub, sub bands of alpha, okay, low, uh, mid, and high. Okay, so what we have here is um, a situation where with low alpha, this is the, this is the sub band that is predominant for this child. Do you see this going from eyes open to eyes closed? 
we have no change. Essentially, we have a population norm that tends to be in green. So if, if the score is, if the color is green, it means we're kind of in the population norm for that aged individual. If it's shading towards blue or purple, that means that we have less than what that uh, normative base would suggest. If it shades towards the red, it means we have more. And you see here, we have no change. You want to see some change, like here, even in the mid band, we have, we go from kind of the average range to above average. So we get a little bit more. You get quite a bit more on high alpha. But remember, what's the dominant brainwave that he's really making use of? It's low alpha. What we need to do is train the brain to generate more of these higher, faster forms of alpha. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, so this assessment shows that we have these two trauma markers at 01. 01 is the 1020 designation for this location in the back. And that's alpha response and peak alpha. This suggests a specific form of training in the back, uh, which includes, which involves inhibiting something called fast alpha, which is sort of an activating brain wave. You want less of that in the back. Enhancing not just alpha, but fast alpha, the faster form of alpha. We want to train the brain to do this. And enhancing theta. Theta was also involved, another slow wave that, that assists in lowering that alarm. This training would be at eyes closed. We want to teach the brain to achieve that kind of destination uh, state with eyes closed. We started with four rounds, four minutes each. That's 16 minutes altogether. Uh, we aimed for four, uh, at least four sessions a week. This uh, young man was actually quite motivated and he achieved that. Uh, and then this case involved fairly um, significant collaboration with the therapist. The therapist was using IF, IFS uh, treatment strategies to try and get at some of that early trauma. Uh, using other PTSD-oriented uh, strategies. One of the things about doing this form of neurofeedback is if you're successful, paradoxically, some of that content may emerge. We may get a bit of ab reaction, a bit of an emotional response. That's good news to a therapist. It is something that you want to have happen in, in controlled conditions, you know, when he's under the guidance of a therapist. In this case, I was able to work with the therapist and, and essentially manage the training so that we got just enough of this response that uh, they were able to uh, make some progress in therapy. And I was able to adjust protocols depending on what was happening in those sessions. This warrants a much longer conversation than we have time for today, but uh, it's one of my favorite things to do is to, and most interesting, I think, is to look at how different protocols can be useful in different phases of psychotherapy. Okay, here's a progress report. Let's see what happened after 17 sessions. So what you have here is a chart that is showing microvolts. This is amplitude on this side. Uh, the percentages over on this side are in reference to the red bars. The red bars are noise. It would be, it would have to do with movement or a poor connection. Um, in, in the case of this child, there was a fair amount of muscle tension and movement. And right about here, I trained him in, in progressive relaxation, one of those traditional tools that we all use to kind of calm folks down. You can see his noise just basically dropped off. Right, because we we're able to to break that cycle of of hyperactivity essentially. Now these three lines here uh, signify the three brain waves that we're training, and you can see these top two are our slow brain waves. So we've got alpha, we've got theta, both of them are on the rise. There's a fair amount of movement, and you expect some of that from session to session uh, um, over time. Uh, but we do have a rise there, and we have a drop in high beta, actually quite a pronounced drop. Let's look at this from a different direction. This shows us, again, at 17 sessions, we're looking at changes in amplitude. And this is showing us uh, alpha. We have a significant rise in alpha. This is, a, I believe, about a 20% rise, which essentially meets target for this uh, um, training protocol. 
um, he's already been able to increase alpha uh, to, a, to a degree that it is likely to be able to calm that alarm down. We also have some rise with theta, 1.43 to 1.46, which we want. And we have a drop in high beta, which we want. We want less of that. That is a monster drop, right? This is quite a, quite a drop down, about 30% 30, 30 roughly, and uh, suggests some pretty dramatic change. Okay. This is, again, at 17 sessions, and he's doing four sessions a week. So this is about a month uh, into training. Okay, let's talk about what was happening to him observationally. At 17 sessions, uh, he had shown uh, some marked improvement in sleep. He was having problems with primary insomnia, having difficulty falling asleep. That essentially went away. Uh, his reported anxiety using the Zung anxiety scale, a uh, standard scale uh, for anxiety, showed a 43% reduction over that period of time. Teachers showed him engaged in, uh, in uh, increasingly engaged in social activities at school. Therapists reported in improved engagement in addressing trauma and some mild increase in the child's ability to begin to speak about trauma related memories. Now, let me just point out at this point, I am not attributing all of that to neurofeedback, uh, but it seems pretty consistent to me with the changes that we see here and what they reflect in terms of the evidence basis for this protocol, that if you get that degree of success in this protocol, you're likely to reduce ab um, amygdala-based anxiety. Finally, uh, with this case, I wanted to continue to maintain that sweet spot of abreaction where you had enough abreaction, enough of an emergence of emotional uh, material that the therapist was able to make use of it without it being too much. Okay, we have a couple of minutes here, so I'm just going to go through uh, case number two, which is situationally based anxiety. And uh, when we're once we've finished this, I, I believe I will have been successful in reserving about 15 minutes uh, for, for questions. And I'd be happy to take your questions at that point. Okay, again, we're going to go through the presenting history. We're going to look at the neurofunctional assessment. We've already talked about expressed versus latent traits. You all are experts on that now. And we're going to look for that overlap. Uh, that's where we're going to focus our training protocol. Okay, in this case, let me just find the appropriate spot. This is a 23-year-old female. Uh, she uh, came into my practice complaining of anxiety, feeling very disorganized, kind of like her life had, had sort of fallen apart. She wasn't able to really function very well with ADLs and um, uh, just kind of making it through her day. She reported a lot of different stressors in her life. She had been fairly high functioning. She had a, 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 a fairly prominent job in a marketing uh, firm, uh, but she had several things hit her at once. She had the loss of a long-term relationship, COVID hit, and so we had social isolation begin to occur and a great deal of disruption that was due to the pandemic. She had no history of, of prior trauma. Now, in this case, you may, uh, I, I know everyone's paying attention, so you know this is one that, that is, uh, I'm trying to illustrate uh, cortically-based anxiety. So we're going to go to the front. Uh, this is a case that reflects uh, a cortically-based anxiety. And what we have here in the front left and front right, okay, so this is the uh, front left cortex, front right cortex, prefrontal cortex. What we have here is a red zone scores for both on something called a theta beta ratio. So theta beta ratio, if you know anything about neurofeedback, you'll know that's a very um, well used term. It's something that we have we see application for throughout the brain. It's the ratio of a slow brain wave to a fast brain wave. And in general, when we're in the midbrain or front, we want, relatively speaking, um, a little less theta, a little less slow wave relative to beta, the fast wave. So the higher the number of the theta-beta ratio, I often do it this way. Here's the numerator, here's the denominator. 
theta is in the top, beta is in the bottom. So the, if they were equal, that number would be 1.0. You can see that top one, the number is 3.07. That means there's three times as much theta amplitude as there is beta amplitude. Okay, that moves us past the clinical threshold of 2.2 suggesting that we have some dysregulation going on in the front left. And really everything I'm saying is going to apply to the front right. It's a little bit less severe, but it's, it's the same principle. So what does that mean? Well, think, think of it this way. A uh, handy little rubric to keep in mind is in contexts like this, we might think of theta as brain fog. Uh, theta is the brain wave that is uh, most commonly associated with drifting off to sleep. When we get a lot of theta as we're drifting off to sleep, we call it drifting off to sleep. When it happens in the daytime, we call it brain fog. Uh, that kind of fuzzy, I can't quite wrap my head around what, what it is that I'm having to deal with. Beta, you might think of as focus. Beta is sort of the workhorse brainwave. This is the brainwave that has to do with you know, the capacity to plan and sequence and uh, make uh, kind of rational assessments. It is also very important, especially in the front left and right, uh, in terms of emotional regulation. If we have a lot of brain fog and not a lot of focus, we're going to have difficulty with emotional regulation, and chances are we're going to be anxious as a result. So these, these are both very common, front left and front right, uh, in cases of anxiety to see dysregulation in, in those areas in the form of, an, of a high theta-beta ratio. I'll also just point out, um, this is a, an oversimplification, but you might think of the front right as having to do with sort of divergent thinking, creativity, thinking outside the box, uh, that sort of thing. Front left, more to do with convergence, uh, planning, logic, sequencing, coming to conclusion. Uh, there is a, 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 a process to emotional regulation that all of us have to go through. And the front left and front right both play a role in emotional regulation. If you're not able to think divergently, think creatively, like maybe I'm, you know, what, what solution to this problem am I not thinking about? That, that kind of frame that sort of comes from here. Or if we're not able to make judgments about what's rational, what's not, am I overreacting? What are my choices? Those kinds of things, then we're gonna have trouble. And she certainly was having trouble with dysregulation in the front. She also has the same theta-beta ratio problem. It's even more severe here in the central zone. Okay, so this is a brainwave uh, pattern uh, in the center. So now we're talking. Now we're not talking about cognition. We're talking about that basic management of fight or flight. And uh, we have a pattern here where there's 3.7 times as much theta relative to beta. We're well in excess of that 2.2 cutoff. This one, uh, this ratio has to do with the brain at rest. So often someone who's dysregulated here um, uh, at rest is having difficulties with attention. Uh, not always, but often it's associated with that. So attention, we think of as kind of a receptive activity. Concentration, which has a, any kind of emotional regulation, requires concentration. It requires kind of problem solving. Um, that, the limbic system plays a role in that. And we get at this, what, what, what the limbic system is contributing to that ability to problem solve by looking at these theta-beta ratio while counting. And all these are, are two different ways of looking at what happens to the midbrain when it's, when we're put under demand. The demand in this case is the person being assessed is asked to count backwards by sevens, uh, which is more difficult than it sounds. And uh, we actually don't care if they get it right particularly, but we want the, them to be really engaged in a complex task. What is supposed to happen with this theta-beta ratio when placed under demand is that theta-beta ratio should drop. Now, if you think about the math there, numerator, denominator, it means theta should drop, brain fog should drop, and beta focus should go up, okay? 
what's happening here in both these cases is the opposite is happening. Instead of getting less theta when, when she was presented with this demand of counting backwards, she's getting more. Instead of getting more beta, which we want, more focus, she's getting less. So this is an experience that often I'll ask people, do you ever have the experience that the harder you try to solve a problem, the worse you do? I said that to her, she burst out into tears because that was exactly her problem, uh, the way she experienced it. She was trying to solve the many, work through the many losses that she had, the difficulties that the pandemic were presenting, and her brain was sort of letting her down. It was not giving her the, the resources that she needed to be able to sustain a problem-solving sequence. And you can see that fairly clearly here. They were having problems at rest, but we're having problems that get even worse when the brain's put under demand. So this is helpful. In some ways, the most therapeutic thing I did with her in the whole training was to normalize this for her, was to help her understand that this is this is a, a question of your brain not being quite in tune. We need to tune your brain, then you can play it better. And uh, that turned out to be um, pretty accurate. Okay, a couple of minutes here. Here is the uh, theta and beta spectra uh, brain maps. Again, eyes open in this column, eyes closed in this column. Uh, you can see how much beta she's got, eyes open and closed, all across the front of the head. She actually needs more of it in the back, but she's got it in the front, okay? And beta, we need more of that. We've got less of it uh, in both cases, okay? So that's just kind of further corroboration of the picture that we have. Uh, what we did in this case uh, was two different protocols. Um, we, have, we have two different problems. We have in the front, and these are all 1020 designations. F3 is the front left, F4 is the front right. We have that theta beta ratio problem. In the midbrain, we have the theta beta ratio problem, the same thing that got worse under demand. So what we did in this case was we did initial training in the front and I picked uh, F, FZ, um, FZ, I was trained by a European, so FZ. Um, so we could pick up both, both uh, sides of the uh, prefrontal cortex and we trained against that TBR ratio. We trained um, down high beta, we trained down theta, and we enhanced something called low beta, which has to do with the capacity to focus. So we started there uh, in the front and then we began to alternate. Once she was up and running with that training, we began to alternate with the same protocol at midbrain. Because remember, the problem in the midbrain is the same. It's the theta beta ratio. Okay, those were six rounds at three minutes each. So that was 18 minutes per training, four sessions a week. This was a supplement to the cognitive behaviorally oriented uh, therapy that I was doing with her. At 32 sessions, uh, we can see, you can just see visually this, this drop in uh, theta. By the way, you'll see the noise. It's common that there will be a certain amount of noise at the beginning. We, we go through a process of training people to physically relax. That has the nice side effect of giving them a tool to use uh, uh, when they're not doing neurofeedback training. Uh, you can see this best here. We've got somewhat of a drop in high beta, not large, but somewhat of a drop. Um, we have low beta actually dropping. We actually don't want low beta to drop. That one's going in the wrong direction. Not uncommon. The brain, it's like juggling. You don't juggle with three balls at once. The brain rarely uh, moves all three brain waves at once. But then we have this substantive drop in theta. By the way, success is not to get people to zero. The only people with brainwave scores at zero are also at room temperature. <laughs> Those are not, that's not the goal. We're often aiming for changes at about 10%, maybe 20% change from baseline. So we have quite a drop here. We've got about a 10% drop um, uh, over time. Okay. So this was a case in which uh, we supplemented uh, cognitive behavioral therapy with neurotherapy. We're trying to reduce that dysregulation at midbrain and in the front. She was showing a reduction of a third in her anxiety uh, scales at that point. 
She was reporting less reactivity, improved ability to communicate. She also got COVID uh, shortly before that progress report. And I'll just tell you, uh, uh, you know, COVID, um, as you know, a certain percentage of cases move into long COVID. Uh, long COVID, there's some pre preliminary evidence that depending on the picture, uh, neurofeedback can be helpful. Um, I, um, of course, there's no way to prove this. We're not running a research uh, lab with her, but I believe we mitigated the effect of uh, cognitive effects of long COVID for her by doing this training. Okay, so now you've seen um, the two cases of um, um, amygdala-based anxiety and cortically-based anxiety. Hopefully you're remembering way back to the beginning of the presentation where we talked about those two being rooted in the fight or flight response and uh, neurofeedback being a way of getting, giving us really a window in or a way into treating that directly. So I'd be happy to take any questions that you all might have and uh, we'll go from here. So there was one question. Let me find it really quickly. It says, how do you describe to clients the difference of the six channels versus the other the other devices that have 24 or more? Oh, what a great question. Um, so um, I can give a short answer or a long answer. <laughs> the short answer and a very pragmatic answer is you can't do 24 channels at home. Okay. And uh, uh, I love that kind of equipment. I have that kind of equipment. I use it in many cases. I will tell you that I tend to think of the mind lift system as a scalpel because one of the advantages of doing this kind of single channel training, and I'll just say parenthetically, I would love two channels. Two channels would more than double uh, the power of what we could do with the, sing with the single channel as it stands. Um, but what it forces you to do is really develop your your theory as to what's happening right as to what what it is that the neurofeedback is accomplishing if you're training at all channels in a in a 19 channel system or, or something like that there are a couple of problems with that one is and i i it, i regret to say this but there are practitioners who can become kind of lazy and sort of train to the norm on all of those channels uh, there are actually potentially some problems uh, with that. Um, with the single channel, you get to follow a line of reasoning like I've just followed today, where we have this dysregulation that tends to propagate forward, and we can begin to see what's affecting what uh, over time. In some ways, the ideal situation for me is to set up a protocol that I am running in office with a multi-channel system and at home with the single channel system, right? And then you get the benefit of both. So I would say it's kind of a matter of different tools have different purposes. Uh, if I have to trade, make a trade off between having one time a week with, you know, multiple channels versus five times a week, four to five times a week with a single channel, I will tell you, I'll take the single channel every time. Cool. All right. Let's go with the next one. Sure. Do you have any suggestions of thought exercises that in, an anxiety patient can be doing during neurofeedback session? Oh, that's great. So one of the things, <laughs> let me tell you my FAQs to, to patients around neurofeedback. And I'm going to get very zen for a moment. The number one uh, uh, tip is don't try so hard, okay? Because trying is a mind thing, not a brain thing. It's the brain that is needing to use this information, right, for, for homeostasis. That's what the brain's trying to do. Our minds, if we start getting at, there's a game called runner, little guy running. If we're focusing on how come he's not running, he just slowed down, what does that mean? What you're doing is you're actually driving up a brainwave called high beta that we're usually mm -hmm. trying to drop, right? So the mind can kind of interfere with this process. And uh, the deeper way that I talk about this is that, again, focus on what you can control and let go of what you can't. Here's the bottom line. Can you control your brainwaves? Not by effort. The only thing you can do is do these four tips I'm about to describe. The first one was don't try. 
those are things you can control and those set the conditions for the brain to be able to say, finally, now I get to move towards homeostasis and do the work that it does. I find with patients, especially who are extremely um, uh, competitive and you know really, really focused on that kind of thing, this actually becomes a therapy issue for them because in many times in their life, they're they're exerting too much effort. You know, they're too much uh, uh, trying to drive and force things instead of kind of sitting back and allowing it to happen. So really briefly, the four, the, the tips are don't try so hard, focus on your breathing. This is a very direct way you can improve almost every protocol because our brains are hardwired, our bodies are hardwired for the limbic system to downregulate when you do deep breathing, especially the exhalation. The exhalation literally sends a message straight to the limbic system that says, settle down. Okay, so deep breathing, something you can control, it will affect your, your training over time. Thirdly, find a point of focus. Find something in the background in the game, or I, I use the logo on the top of my tablet. Focus on that, let the information come in peripherally, so to speak, and you'll, you'll get where you need to go. Fourthly, Fourthly, there we go, understand the nature of any kind of healing. It is never a straight line like this, right? The nature of healing, anything from breaking a bone all the way through psychotherapy and neurofeedback is more like this, right? There's ups and downs where the trend is up. So I really want to encourage people not to freak out if you find that there's some ups and downs, right? Because that's literally how the brain is learning what works and what doesn't work. Cool. Thank you. Sure. This one, I, um, does MindLift factor in age-specific norms for the various brain waves? It's a two-part question. Let's start with the part one. Uh, yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> uh, and the, the brain maps in particular are, are uh, focusing on your, that, that normative group is norming against, uh, against age. Cool. And then for case number one, did you use two rewards and one inhibit? What were they set at? Yeah. So uh, this was for case one. So case one was the PTSD case. That was uh, 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 two rewards and one inhibit. That, that's exactly right. So it was rewarding fast alpha. Remember, because they were having a problem where it was all slow alpha. We wanted to move up to fast alpha and theta, we're trying to reward both of those. We're trying to inhibit high beta, which is uh, more of an activating brainwave that we want less, at, less of. Cool, thank you. Sure. And then let's choose this one. So anxiety management using alcohol as a way of numbing the experience. I have felt that some forms of meditation are not effective because they are basically just versions of numbing that wears off and makes the problem worse by avoiding it. In what way is neurofeedback different? Oh, I love that question. Uh, first of all, uh, I agree with that about, about the uh, numbing idea. Uh, people, let me put it this way, uh, mindfulness, you know, is a term that everyone uses now. And there is a precise meaning around mindfulness, um, but there's an imprecise meaning that just means kind of uh, just mellowing out, right? And I think that's probably what the person asking the question is referring to, the kind of mindfulness where you're just sort of leaving everything behind. Um, so I think that's absolutely true that those kinds of tools can be misused. With neurofeedback, it's different because it calls, I'm going to go back to kind of the Zen thing, it calls for engagement without trying, okay? It calls for um, kind of being, being, uh, giving an, giving an, giving an effort leading into it, but letting go of the result, letting go of the outcome that if neurofeed, if the person is engaged in neurofeedback, they're practicing very different than avoiding, right? They're, they're in this kind of, um, it can feel almost paradoxical where you're engaged in, in the effort, but you're not trying, you're not worried too much about the outcome. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, I, I find the experience of neurofeedback is much more uh, active, if you will, than, than at least some forms of meditation. Great. And I think we have time for one more question. And 
Let's see. Are the assessment ratio results you shared for the two cases automatically included in MindLift, or did you need to do additional calculations? Also a great question. Uh, those are automatically included. And um, this is another thing I find really helpful with the MindLift system. And there are other systems that do this single channel, but MindLift is the most comprehensive compared to a QEG, a larger system, is that the, the, the ratios, if you think about them uh, uh, for a moment, a ratio by definition is talking about the relationship between two, usually it's two frequencies, right? They don't include every single ratio you could possibly have. They only include the ones for which there's an empirical evidence-based reason to think that it connects to an outcome, right? So you get the relevant ratios uh, with, with this. Uh, most of the Q systems that I'm familiar with don't use um, ratios. They, they don't offer ratios. They offer the brain map, right, which is valuable in its own way. That's giving you a more granular view of each individual brain wave rather than that connection. There are some Q systems that have, um, will do those additional calculations for ratios, but it's right there in the MindLift system. Great. Well, that about wraps us up, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much. And thank you, you everybody for joining. I see a lot of people I've done demos with. Um, and thank you for your engagement and coming back. Um, this was super helpful. Uh, I did get some questions about being interested in starting with us. You can either uh, write in the chat uh, your email and I'll contact you directly, or you can go to our website and sign up for a demo. Um, and then going off the exact last question that we went on, I just wanted to remind you all that all those reports that you saw, you will have access through via the MindLift system. They're very easy to generate and very easy to share with your clients. So thank you again. I look forward to hearing from you in the future. And thank you again, Dr. Brown. You bet. Thank you, everybody.